Submarines. You know as well as I do that submarines are real giants cruising the seas and oceans, leaving anyone who sees them in person amazed. Even in photos or videos, subs look impressive. For example, take a look at the Ohio-class submarines in service with the U.S. Their surface displacement is 16,746 tons, and when submerged, it's 19,750 tons. These boats are 560 feet long and 42 feet wide. Or take the submarine TK-208 Dmitry Donskoy, built by the Soviet Union. This vessel, which moves either under or over water, is 564 feet long, 76 feet wide, and has a displacement of 23,200 tons above water and 48,000 tons when submerged. Even their smaller counterparts are quite impressive. For example, the Golf-class submarines are about 330 feet long and have a displacement just shy of 3,000 tons. Of course, nowadays, that's hardly impressive these days. So why are we focusing so much on the size? Well, that's because one of the submarines, the Soviet K-129, was actually stolen. And snatching something that big is no small feat. The Sinking and the Search In March 1968, the submarine K-129 sank while on a mission. Skipping ahead, it's worth saying there were plenty of reasons for its crash. There were theories like a hydrogen explosion during battery charging, flooding through a hatch while charging the batteries due to a faulty valve, or a plunge to an extreme depth. Some even said the U.S. Navy submarine USS Swordfish or some surface ship was to blame. In April of that year, the surface and air forces of the Soviet Pacific Fleet were concentrated in a location known to be tied to the routes of those very Gulf-class submarines we mentioned earlier. The U.S. immediately realized they were looking for a sunken sub, and they were looking without success, because after a few weeks, the Soviet forces involved in the search went back to their regular activities. And that's when the Americans stepped in. The U.S. Navy analyzed acoustic data recorded by their SOSIS hydrophone network in the northern Pacific and managed to pinpoint the approximate location where the K-129 submarine went down. Then, Operation Sand Dollar began. To give you a sense of how much the U.S. wanted to find the Soviet Union's missing submarine, let me share an interesting fact. The nuclear submarine USS Halibut managed to locate K-129 in just three weeks thanks to its cutting-edge equipment for the time, but it took a full five months to find the American submarine USS Scorpion, which sank in the same year, 1968. And get this, the Halibut didn't even go looking there. The search ship, with the help of its robotic underwater cameras, reportedly managed to take over 20,000 close-ups of every detail of the K-129 wreck. Naturally, there are no photos, and there never were. The mission's top secret. It's claimed that photos were handed over to the CIA, which said there's a good chance that one nuclear missile on K-129 is still intact. Mind you, all this was happening in the late 60s. The Cold War was in full swing. The arms race, the constant drive for the U.S. to outdo the Soviet Union, it was all part of the showdown. And then a submarine sank with a nuclear missile. The USSR's adversary couldn't find it. Why doesn't the U.S. pull off an incredible lift operation? Project Azorian So the officials were serious about this. In 1970, U.S. Secretary of Defense Melvin Laird and National Security Advisor Henry Kissinger came up with a secret plan that was well-received by President Richard Nixon, and the CIA got involved, kicking off a project called Azorian. In the intelligence agency, they figured that the easiest way to lift it would be to use a sort of claw that would grab the sunken K-129 submarine, but there was one big but. They had to raise an object that weighs more than just a bottle or some small lost item like a wallet. This was a whole submarine with a displacement of about 3,000 tons and a length of 330 feet. Of course, this required serious development, testing, checking, and choosing the right materials because lifting such a giant from the bottom is no small task for the already existing devices. So to create a special claw, they turned to Lockheed Shipbuilding, a company that had already produced several large watercraft by that time. Lockheed Shipbuilding could 
could have turned down such a grand proposal, but hey, this is the CIA we're talking about. Thus began the creation of a device unlike anything that had ever existed before. As a result, the company created a claw device that could be lowered and raised on a chain. All the parts of the multi-section system were connected together, and the system was designed to lower the claw through a hole in the middle of the ship, grab the desired object, and then lift it back onto the vessel. To figure out where to drag a big object up from the bottom, you don't need to stretch your imagination too much. A lot of specialized vessels have had and still have that ability. They have a moon pool, an opening in the ship's hull that gives access to the water below. In modern versions, this feature often turns into a complex system with lots of equipment. However, you can safely say that a moon pool is a must-have for technicians, researchers, or other experts who need to lower tools, devices, and various apparatus safely into the water. As you might have guessed, in some cases, this kind of setup is perfect for lifting especially important objects for the state. Well, it's clear how the claw works, but it had to be somehow delivered to the wreck site of the submarine K-129. They needed a special ship, because not just any vessel can haul huge claws for lifting submarines from depths of over 16,000 feet, and they had to pull this off quietly. Remember the Cold War. The Soviet Union would definitely not be cool with anyone raising that precious object that could reveal a ton of secrets. That's exactly what the CIA is for. They came up with a genius plan. The CIA awarded a contract to create a special ship to Sun Shipbuilding in Dry Dock, which during World War II built tankers, cargo ships, hospital ships, and escort aircraft carriers. They definitely knew how to create something big. Plus, Global Marine was involved, the company that at the time was part of an ambitious project to drill down to the boundary between the Earth's crust and mantle, so they had certain developments that fit the submarine theft project. What about secrecy? A billionaire businessman named Howard Hughes has stepped in and literally merged with the secret project. As a result, a very believable legend was created about yet another eccentric billionaire creating a vessel for mining concretions. These are the things that form on the ocean floor and contain valuable metals. Valuable metals and a rich guy? They just seem to go hand in hand. So the story seemed perfectly plausible. And so in 1972, 350 million or $1.7 billion in today's money finally became what was meant to ensure the US had the upper hand over the Soviet Union in the Cold War, the Hughes Glomar Explorer. Yeah, the CIA thought that even the name should be designed to keep everyone focused on the entrepreneur who was just looking to make a quick buck again. The ship had a displacement reaching an impressive 51,310 tons. Its length was 620 feet, its width was 115 feet, and the crew consisted of 178 people. This massive vessel was definitely capable of retrieving K-129 from the ocean floor. Moreover, the lifting had to be carried out as safely as possible since the ship was equipped with a dynamic positioning system that allowed it to stay in a fixed position above the submarine's recovery site. To give you an idea of how advanced and expensive the ship was, after the Azorian project, it was put into storage for two years due to a lack of buyers willing to pay that much. Overall, everything was ready to kick off the operation. However, the Hughes Glomar Explorer was missing that crucial claw that was supposed to do the main job. They didn't make it right away on the ship, since that would have tipped off enemy intelligence. So let's go back to how they got the claw onto the ship. And for that, the CIA also came up with a brilliant plan. They needed a huge barge with a displacement of 5,893 tons when empty or 11,050 tons when fully loaded, measuring 325 feet long and 105 feet wide. By the way, to ensure total secrecy on the Azorian project, even the creation of the claw was happening under the roof of this watercraft. To get the claw onto the HBM-1 barge, it was towed over to Catalina Island off the coast of California. The claw was placed on stabilizing supports on the seabed and then lifted into a huge moon pool on the barge. Even at this point, it feels like something out of a movie like Mission Impossible. It's an amazing operation, no doubt about it. Lift Operation So in full battle readiness, the ship arrived at the wreck site of the K-129 submarine on July 4th, 1974. Six years of prep, non-stop secrecy, a bunch of distraction maneuvers, and a ton of hopes has had to result in something significant. The Hughes Glomar Explorer was at the wreck site and working on the recovery for nearly a month. Soviet ships even came by, obviously on edge about the American suspicious actions. However, the USSR, despite warnings from its high-ranking officials, didn't interfere at all. 
They just didn't have any information on the whereabouts of K-129. When it comes to what went down during the operation, it's important to mention that there's no solid documentation. One theory suggests that while being lifted with the claws, two-thirds of the sub dropped back to the ocean floor. Another version says that the ship's gripping claws broke because they were made of miraging steel, which is really strong but not as flexible compared to other materials. There's also a version that only the 40-foot bow was raised, while the rest, along with the sought-after nuclear torpedoes, went back down to the bottom. In 2010, the CIA declassified a report about the outcomes and progress of the operation. Of course, a ton of information was censored, but you can still piece together the approximate results by adding in comments from people involved in the project. So the original goal was the 157-foot nose section of K-129, where the most important stuff was supposed to be. The claw grabbed it. But during the lift, part of it broke off and fell back to the ocean floor. The U.S. only ended up with a 39-foot fragment. What was there is unknown. As we've already said, the U.S. was looking for nuclear torpedoes. What we can say for sure is that in the raised part, the bodies of sailors were found. There's a video showing American personnel conducting their burial with full honors and in accordance with naval customs. This recording was reportedly sent to the Russian government in 1992. By the way, such an incredible and even crazy project couldn't help but attract the attention of conspiracy theory fans. Some claim that the goal of the project to raise the Soviet submarine was just a smokescreen for something else, like listening in on underwater communication cables, covering up murders, setting up a giant missile silo, or repairing surveillance and tracking systems for surface and underwater vessels. And naturally, there were mentions of Atlantis. Yes, it was claimed that once again, humanity knows about the existence of this civilization, but is just hiding the information behind grand secret projects. Sea Shadow you think the Project Azorian's contribution to the world of top secret stuff was over? Well, take a good look at the barge. Yeah, the one where the claw was made. After the Grand Project wrapped up, the barge was put into storage at the Todd Shipyard in San Francisco, California. Then, the U.S. Navy towed it to a facility in Redwood City to the renowned creators of amazing military solutions, Lockheed. The experts took a look at it and said, why leave it sitting around? After all, its size, 325 feet long and 105 feet wide, could easily be used just like during the Azorian project to create another top secret object. That object became the Sea Shadow Ship, which was built in 1984. You've likely noticed how much it looks like planes built using stealth technology. These are the futuristic flying vehicles that have fascinated people for a long time. Their biggest selling point was this very technology. It offered stealth that outshone anything made before. And that's why they developed the Sea Shadow, to use stealth tech on water. It all started with the idea that the slanted lines of the F-117 fighter jet could reduce its sonar signature. However, this notion was dismissed and another idea came along to use the technology to build ships that wouldn't be visible on radars. On top of that, before the tests, there was another goal to check how seawater affects the iron coating that absorbs radar waves. So the folks at Lockheed were planning to create a vessel that could hide not only from surface ship radars, but also from radar satellites. For example, from the Soviet ROS satellite, which was launched to monitor NATO's waterborne transport from 1967 to 1988. Besides stealth, the creators equipped the Sea Shadow with a swath-type hull. It has two parts with propellers, aft stabilizers, and an inboard hydrofoil, plus a small waterline area. This design allowed the Sea Shadow to stay stable in rough water up to 6 on the Buford scale, with wave heights reaching up to 18 feet. The ship's trial started in 1985. You might think it was definitely meant to be military. They planned to install a big radar in the cargo bay and even Patriot air defense system, but no weapons were ever put on board. Just 12 bunks, a microwave, a fridge, and a table. Basically a futuristic floating barracks. So what's the outcome? The secret's out, they revealed the ship back in 1993. However, it ultimately proved to be of little practical use. Built on a barge that was once the site of brainstorming for a claw to lift the K-129 submarine, the Sea Shadow was put up for sale in 2006. Strangely, no one bought it, so the military put it up for auction with a rule that the buyer had to scrap it. In 2012, Bay Ship and Yacht finally closed the chapter on this stealthy watercraft.
However, some of the principles that made the Sea Shadow innovative were applied in the construction of the new generation Zumwalt destroyers. This shows how the Azorian project influenced future shipbuilding. 